tous. Good evening, everybody. So we shall start this uh, session number 16. Yes, 16th session already. The uh, title is How Can We Ensure Our Defense? So you may have gathered that there are economic uh, considerations, but at the heart of it, there will be geopolitics and geostrategy. So to discuss this subject, we're very fortunate indeed. We have very distinguished guests um, who are experts in the field. What you need to bear in mind is that uh, had this schedule and the listing of sessions uh, decided six months ago, we would we might not have uh, uh, had this session organized because, as you may have guessed, we are going to talk about the repercussions of uh, Russia invading Ukraine. This caused a number of um, disruptions from a geopolitical perspective, geostrategic perspective. Uh, but as you know, it also uh, caused a major disruption in terms of energy supply for European countries, but not only European uh, countries, because the price of hydrocarbons has gone up uh, all around the world and also other, other commodities or raw material. Um, and the repercussions on price uh, has prompted a hike in inflation, but you might remind, you might remember that inflation had already gone up before uh, the crisis in Ukraine, and that um, already we had seen it in the, during the COVID pandemic with the, the um, uh, world supply chains uh, being impacted. So, uh, but we're not going to tackle really the economics of that question. Um, not exclusively at any rate. Maybe I'll start with something that might seem a bit simplistic or something thought short of a joke, but, uh, Admiral, please correct me if I'm wrong, but in the army, we say that you don't ask, well, when you want, uh, you, you don't invest uh, the same amount if you want um, uh, a military force uh, to parade on the parading ground or if you wanted to actually go in combat. Um, so, which begs the question of uh, overhauling the defense uh, policy of a number of countries and amongst them European countries. To discuss all of this, uh, let's maybe split this session in three parts. Firstly, I'll give the floor to one of the actual players uh, in our defense uh, policy, and we'll uh, uh, listen to Anders Foss uh, Rasmussen. Uh, he is a former uh, Danish prime minister from 2001 to 2009. Uh, then you uh, joined NATO as its secretary general. Uh, and you were Secretary General of NATO until 2014. I think, Mr. Rasmussen, but I'll, I'll introduce everybody and then I'll give you the floor uh, individually. Mr. Rasmussen might be able to give, uh, give his insight on the new roadmap of NATO that was decided the last, the, the, the uh, latest Madrid summit at the end of June. That roadmap, NATO roadmap, uh, features two uh, main elements, which is to consider the Russian Federation as being clearly identified as a threat. The uh, uh, biggest and most direct threat for NATO countries. And another aspect, because we shall not only talk about the war in, in Ukraine, uh, well, let's not talk about adversaries, but the fact that China is seen as a challenge, a challenge to our values. This is the, uh, the wording from the uh, press release, to our values, the values uh, uh, of uh, uh, NATO alliance. So it's also about ensuring our defense, not only in Ukraine, but in the Pacific. Uh, still amongst the players, uh, uh, so actual defense players, uh, Admiral uh, Paul Vanier, uh, Pierre Vanier, apologies, from the French Navy. Um, you were the chief of staff of uh, the uh, minister of uh, uh, the French min uh, uh, army minister. Uh, and I talked about uh, 
China being a, uh, a major challenge, I think probably the Navy uh, has a lot to say about what can be done in the Pacific. I'll then give the floor to representatives of um, uh, partners, uh, partner countries. Um, uh, these two countries are Germany and the UK. We'll listen to Hans-Dieter Lukas, who is the ambassador, uh, the German ambassador in France. Uh, ever since September 2020, if I got that uh, right, you were formerly the German representative uh, uh, at NATO. Uh, uh, so you probably have uh, very good insight in terms of geopolitics and defense. Well, I guess it's... Uh, mm, uh, uh, given that the paradigm of German defense has uh, been completely um, uh, overhauled uh, since the war in Ukraine. And then we'll move on with Lord Peter, so Peter Rickett. Uh, you've also been uh, the permanent representative of the UK uh, uh, in NATO. You also were uh, an advisor uh, for national, secu national security uh, at the 10 Downing Street and uh, ambassador, a UK ambassador in France uh, until uh, from uh, 2011 to 2015. Uh, we all know that the UK has given very strong support, actually ranking first in terms of the, extents, uh, the extent of its support, uh, over uh, 10 billion uh, in military uh, aid uh, to Ukraine. So still in that second part, um, sharing the viewpoints of uh, countries that are uh, partners of France, I'll give the floor to Mr. Renato Flores, who's at the head of a think tank uh, called the International uh, Intelligence Unit. Uh, you are an academic. You have actually uh, had a long career in many different universities, and including European ones, Belgium, uh, France, Italy, Portugal, the UK. So maybe you'll tell us uh, how these geostrategic uh, disruptions are experienced uh, uh, in uh, such countries as Brazil. And the third part in this uh, uh, about the fact that this high intensity conflict that uh, could not have been predicted uh, goes to show that all the uh, airborne um, and uh, uh, terrestrial uh, military forces as well as the navy uh, and but the, but space is also uh, one of the uh, uh, theaters of operation. We saw that cybersecurity is also an important element to ensure our defense. And to discuss that, I'll give uh, the floor to uh, Ms. Véronique Brion. She's the, the head of Chubb France. It's the uh, largest insurance company on the insurance of property. Uh, and they uh, are, uh, well, she's best placed to tell us about uh, cybersecurity risks because, of course, this is not only a threat for the military, it's also a threat for uh, all private citizens. So I'll give the floor to Mr. Rasmussen first. Thank you very much. I speak French, I speak a little French, but I'd, I'd rather speak uh, English if that's okay. Approaching a new world order. And uh, the outcome of the war in Ukraine will determine that world order. If Putin succeeds, we will have a world order where it is not the rule of law, but the rule of the strongest that will dominate. That will send a bad signal to China that will consider it an invitation to attack Taiwan. A lot is at stake, and that's why Ukraine must win this war, or at least ensure that Putin doesn't succeed. The Ukrainian people has demonstrated the will to fight. It is our obligation to provide them with 
the means to fight. That means weapons, heavy weapons, long range weapons. In that respect, I think we have all an obligation and allow me, please allow me to say, I would like to see France in particular step up to the plate. Um, according to a new survey, Germany, of all countries, Germany is providing 10 times as much military equipment to Ukraine as France. I find it quite embarrassing. So I would like France to step up to the plate. My second remark concerns economics, because this is, at the end of the day, very much about economics. We should immediately stop financing the financing of Putin's war machine. The oil embargo, the EU oil embargo should be followed by a complete gas embargo. We should stop all trade, actually, with Russia. Western companies still operating in Russia should be subject to consumer boycott. I think the only way to put a quick end to this conflict is to cut Russia completely off the global economic system. It's also about rebuilding what the Russians have destroyed. Um, it is a fact that a complete gas embargo comes at a price. We will all have to pay more for energy, but this price will be lower than the long-term cost of continued war and destruction uh, in Ukraine. Uh, the European Investment Bank has estimated that the cost of rebuilding Ukraine will be more than one trillion euros. That's a lot of money. And I saw with my own eyes, last week I visited Ukraine, I visited Irpin, saw the destruction, completely unprovoked, meaningless uh, destruction of Irpin uh, caused by uh, the Russians. So a reconstruction of Ukraine uh, is really a matter of urgency. And it doesn't make sense that with the one hand, we help the Ukrainians with weapons and rebuilding, and with the other hand, we continue to finance Putin's war machine to destroy everything that we help the Ukrainians to build. It's crazy. Now, my third remark uh, is about security guarantees for Ukraine. Uh, some weeks ago, President Zelensky asked me uh, to chair an international group uh, that should, uh, with the task, to prepare recommendations to him and his government as to how we can secure Ukraine in the future. We have had the first meeting, and it seems obvious uh, that one cornerstone in security guarantees for Ukraine would be to allow Ukraine to have a sufficiently strong and sufficiently sizable military force so that Russia cannot invade uh, the country uh, once again. In addition to that, we could imagine big allies in, uh, ensure, issue security assurances, the US, UK, France, Germany, Turkey, just to mention a few. And we should take this opportunity to build a new Ukraine, not only physically new buildings, but also a strengthened combat of uh, corruption and to get rid of the oligarchization uh, of, um, of Ukraine. The fact is that once Russia stops fighting, we have no war. But if the Ukrainians stop fighting, we have no Ukraine. So we should not offer Putin an off-ramp there's only one way out of the mess 
he has created in Ukraine, and that is out of Ukraine. Merci beaucoup, Mr. Rasmussen. Thank you very much, Mr. Rasmussen. I'll give the floor straight away to Admiral Vanier. Vendier, apologies. Well, thank you for giving me the floor, and thank you for uh, in, uh, inviting a uh, military man uh, in this panel. Uh, because uh, as we talk about uh, recovery, it might seem uh, not uh, uh, obvious. Alfred Mahon is the proponent of sea power. He said the necessity of warships is born of the existence of the merchant navy. This has not changed. I'll tell you about trade and strategy. Three points. Firstly, I'll borrow the words of the Secretary General. Uh, when we uh, when we come, uh, we talk about strategy, I think we've turned the table because it's the first time since the Cold War that we've had a centralization, and an aggressive one. Um, what I mean by that is that a country with uh, uh, nuclear power invaded another country and l restricted the uh, help to the aggressed country thanks to his nuclear deterrent. It's the first time we've ever uh, experienced that since the beginning of the Cold War. This is uh, really uh, worrisome and dangerous. This brings to uh, the near collapse of all the system that uh, we've set up. Number of treaties that are being dismantled are no longer uh, respected. The uh, treaty in Europe on uh, intermediary nuclear forces, but also the uh, gradual dismantling of the Monte Corbe, um sea uh, 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 charter, sea treaty. So uh, it is impossible, uh, it's, it has become uh, impossible to find a uh, circle in which we can actually uh, negotiate uh, uh, shared rules. What we've negotiated at the end of the Cold War can no longer ensure our security because it's back to the um, uh, survival of the fittest or uh, the uh, power of uh, force. Uh, and things have become completely unpredictable in terms of um, uh, strate strategic uh, uh, visibility. I think there have been three main uh, prophecies that have burst like uh, soap bubbles that economic independence uh, helped, prevented, pre helped prevent war. We saw that with gas that uh, it uh, does not preclude tensions. Liberal economy is, the, uh, is not um, uh, necessarily, uh, does not go hand in hand with democracy. And and, uh, you know, uh, you will, uh, vegetarians will never convince um, uh, uh, meat eaters to uh, stop wanting to uh, um, uh, eat meat and uh, uh, amongst animals, uh, uh, the animals uh, will go on uh, hunting. So uh, this cycle, uh, of course, is marked by uh, the violence of war. There's this... Um, uh, sort of keystone of a nuclear deterrent that is still uh, um, uh, helping us avoid uh, the war. This is what nuclear deterrents are about. But there's hybrid war that bypasses uh, the, the rule of law, and that means that you can wage a war without having uh, a declared war or uh, prompted it. And that's a new form of violence that includes very violent uh, tools. We saw that in Karabakh. Uh, the images in Ukraine are uh, uh, very striking. For uh, uh, me as a Navy man, uh, and it's, uh, the th the, another consequence for uh, 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 the, in the maritime world, there's been uh, an unprecedented rearmament of uh, navies. Not only uh, uh, China, third, um, uh, uh, third uh, aircraft carrier that has uh, actually uh, 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 been uh, uh, commissioned, but the number of uh, ships, uh, arms, missiles that are being commissioned, this questions the whole balance of military power. It changes completely the landscape in terms of uh, 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 a navy and uh, 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 the whole uh, space for transit and freedom has become a, um, uh, a space for military maneuvers. And the capacity to control that uh, space is called into question. That the, the dispute of maritime space goes from uh, the uh, uh, deep seabed to cyber security. We are regularly uh, the target of cyber attacks. We have to strengthen our systems. We have to make sure that our systems in the high-low uh, mix 
uh, uh, that we have also high, uh, both high-intensity weapons and low-intensity weapons. We need to secure our operational um, readiness, and we need to work as part of coalition. We do not have enough equipment uh, to uh, go it single, uh, go it alone. Uh, in conclusion, I think it's the end of the era of low-cost defense. If we do not invest more, we'll lose, and we'll lose part of the world over which we currently still have power. The sheer uh, velocity of this, the spread of violence, and apologies for our uh, UK friends, but uh, uh, it's back to uh, our uh, wars. Uh, in uh, uh, wars, uh, defeat can be uh, encapsulated in two words, too late. Thank you very much. Uh, well, you see, uh, the Navy is, of course, welcome, and uh, uh, any military uh, representative is not only welcome, but applauded. So let's move on to the second uh, section. I'll give the floor to Mr. Lucas, who is a German ambassador in France, and he'll share with us the uh, uh, upheaval of um, uh, the upheavals in um, German defense. Well, yes, thank you very much. Uh, the German population, same as the pol uh, same as German politicians, perceived war in Ukraine as a complete paradigm shift. It's a new era, uh, and maybe more so than for us, for us than for our friends in the UK or in France, because of course after uh, after the after the war, uh, it was this late motif, never again. And for us, uh, the uh, you know uh, building the EU is something really special, which is why the German government, three days after the invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia, uh, uh, started a complete uh, uh, overhaul of uh, German uh, German uh, um, defense. Uh, and uh, so it was a, a Zeitwende, as we uh, call it, a uh, complete shift. Uh, first, uh, we can uh, deliver heavy weapon to Ukraine, which is completely new. German hasn't uh, d uh, uh, delivered heavy weapon to any non-NATO uh, country. Uh, for uh, two decades. Second element, we strengthened significantly our military presence in the Baltic countries, in Slovenia and Romania, as part of NATO. Um, but it is clear to us that NATO should not become uh, a, um, a part in the conflict. Uh, and thirdly, we're going to invest a uh, hundred billion euros, additional 100 billion euros in our uh, military force. That is to say, we are going to outstrip the 2% GDP mark, uh, which is the rule for NATO uh, members uh, in terms of uh, defense budget. And we so uh, uh, decided to give the Bundeswehr what they need, but also invest in uh, 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 European defense. To that end, we've already made headway, uh, setting up uh, a fund, a facility, a European facility for peace, but also major uh, French-German uh, initiatives, the SCAF, uh, so uh, aircraft of the future, drones, uh, and uh, tank of the future. Uh, those projects are complex, but they're absolutely essential for Germany. And uh, for us, it really is part and parcel of the European uh, uh, initiative, so as to have a strong uh, European basis for uh, defense. And France and Germany, of course, have a major role to play. Quick comment on NATO. There was this NATO summit in Madrid. And uh, this was a seminal moment, a uh, real, real success of a summit, a uh, new uh, strategic role for uh, NATO. We uh, uh, endorsed uh, the uh, joining of uh, Sweden and Finland, very important because it's going to make us stronger. And 
we also decided to strengthen our military uh, position on the eastern flank and uh, Germany will contribute to that to a great extent. Last word about energy considerations, because it is very much uh, uh, a, um, a focus, uh, and uh, uh, Germans, uh, Germany's dependency uh, in terms of energy uh, uh, is a case in point. We want to completely um, eradicate our dependency on fossil fuel, uh, fossil fuel, and we are uh, completely cutting off our dependency to um, uh, our dependency on uh, Russian gas and Russian oil, and we want to speed up the development of renewable energy. Uh, final word to say uh, that about the role of Germany in the world and its counter proposal in terms of security in Europe. This is. Uh, uh, something short of a revolution for us because of this war. Germany uh, has, for the first time in its entire history, uh, devised a national strategy for security that will be made public next year. We've all understood that what we've um, obtained together, peace, democracy, prosperity, these are, should not be taken for granted. This, this we have to fight for. And over and above that, I think the democratic and liberal model is under attack everywhere in the world. So my conclusion is that we need to build a stronger uh, Europe that protects, that defends. And against that backdrop, I think uh, um, cooperation between France and Germany is absolutely essential. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, Your Excellency. Thank you very much. Indeed, it's not a matter of defense policy, but it's also the energy policy that uh, have known upheavals in Germany with the Ukrainian war. That's going to be one of the hot topics, um, especially with Nord Stream 1. Nord Stream 2 is actually um, part of the past already. But as for Nord Stream 1, actually, the flows have uh, been reduced by 40 percent. And we have discussions for next week, and we actually fear that uh, they will not reopen uh, uh, the uh, gas flow afterwards again. We'll have also a post-Brexit opinion now, uh, a, uh, an opinion from the UK, a post from her. That's actually the opinion of a calm, stable country, something that is very foreseeable, that actually does foreseeable actions. We still have Mr. Johnson, and he holds on tight to power as a uh, muscle to rock, actually. In English, to, to be brief, I think the political chaos in London in recent weeks and months has been really damaging <coughs> to the role that Britain can play in a dangerous world. Uh, thank goodness it has not stopped Britain giving, I think, a European leadership in the Ukraine crisis. It, this plays to Britain's strengths because we are the largest defense spender in Europe um, because we have had a relationship with the Ukraine armed forces going back to 2015 and because politically it has suited London post-Brexit to show that Britain's role in NATO is still important. And I agree very much with what um, uh, Prime Minister Rasmussen said. Uh, we must not let Putin win. My fear is that we won't the Ukrainians won't be able to drive Russia out completely, and that what we risk is a hostile stalemate uh, with Russia still occupying parts of Ukraine and the West having to spend the sort of money the Prime Minister talked about to sustain an independent Ukraine in the rest of the country. That's a recipe for instability in Europe for years to come, but it feels to me the most likely uh, outcome of, of this crisis. And um, as the ambassador said, the um, NATO summit outcome was very important. Britain has been particularly active in the northern flank of NATO uh, with cooperation with the Nordic Baltic countries, which is back to a role Britain played in NATO during the Cold War. But the new doctrine of forward deployment and high readiness forces has actually shown us that the British Army is now too small and is not well equipped 
for possible fighting in Europe. It's got too much legacy equipment from Afghanistan and Iraq. So although we spend over 2% uh, of our GDP on defense, we're going to have to spend more. And that's got real political implications. Uh, for European defense, I think it's clear now for Britain that Europe is the center of our national security. Um, and one lesson we have learned is you cannot have good relations bilaterally with individual European countries if you have a bad relationship with the European Union. Um, and I see um, to some despair in sometimes that the cooperation we built with France in the defense area has weakened over the last few years. Thank goodness, as Monsieur Lamiral said, between armed forces it still works well, but defense industrial cooperation is much less strong than it could have been. And Britain ought to be playing a part in the European coordination on issues like military movement in case we needed to reinforce our armed forces. America, Canada, Norway are part of that and Britain is not. So my profound hope is that the combination of the Ukraine crisis um, and a change of uh, tenant in Downing Street will be an opportunity for Britain to rebuild a cooperative and grown-up relationship with the European Union and to be able to repair the damage uh, to cooperation with France and Germany, which I'm afraid has happened during Boris Johnson's years. I just wanted to say very briefly one word about um, China and the Far East. Britain and France are Europe's two Indo-Pacific powers. And therefore, it was, to my mind, stupid that the AUKUS aircraft carrier deal was handled in a way which left France here feeling humiliated and excluded. Because we need to be working together uh, with the Americans, uh, with France, with other Europeans in the Far East. It's good that NATO identified China as a systemic competitor. We need to be coordinating with the Americans on China policy. Uh, I think it makes no sense to have European strategic autonomy, American strategic autonomy separately. Uh, I thought what Christine Lagarde talked about friend shoring, in other words, not onshoring just to one country uh, technological sovereignty, but having uh, the sovereignty shared among allies so we never again find ourselves with China dominating the future of technology. But we need, I think, to work out a European policy on China, which is not necessarily full-on um, com confrontation, but which is a mixture of being very vigilant on security, but working with China where we need to on issues like climate change and energy um, and commercial relations where we can. So that's not necessarily the approach uh, that a new Republican administration might take in Washington. And that's my final conclusion. The UK and Europe need to work better together as an insurance policy against um, the return of a Trump-like figure in the White House. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Lord Rick. Thank you very much, Lord Rickett. As you have understood, after these four speeches, what we have is a great cohesion between the members, the member countries of NATO, and they didn't anticipate that when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. We found it also at the United Nations. We have a lot of debates with other countries as well, those that are not aligned and that refuse to align themselves. It's also very important. And I think we should give the floor to Mr. Flores, who's a specialist of international, um, uh, international politics and that will talk about it. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, given the time limits, I'm not to going to make a presentation. I rather kindly and coolly invite my fellow panelists and the audience to calmly consider three questions on the present signals and trends. It's an invitation. So 
let us put ourselves one year from now and make three questions. First question, what about the state of Europe? How will, will it present itself as a heavily energy dependent region which has successfully made ends meet? As a macroeconomic space in full growth mode with low inflation, a strong euro and less social tensions? As a union where the key original objectives of a smart, peaceful and autonomous Europe have been strengthened? Second question, in what has a defense capability for Europe turned out? As an advanced striking arm of the US forces to destroy up to the Asian borders any power annoying U.S. hegemony as a force that translates, protect, and prevent, int, provoke, and menace as the main agent of the eternal return of the viewpoint of a common, or maybe two, absolute and hideous enemies to be aggressively circumscribed as a way to build up a fence of long-range missiles around the European border pointing out the outside rest as a sink of billions and I say billions of euros that should have been invested in more culture, education, health systems, innovation, and sustainable practices. Briefly, the great European assets, but rather went to the international weapons manufacturers oligopoly. Third question. Comme disait Charles Trenet, que reste-t-il? What remained of peace, rule of law, and multilateralism? If rule of law is to confiscate under the euphemism of freezing the international reserves of sovereign, of sovereign states duly and faithfully deposit in its banks. What's going to come afterwards? If, after responding to an undeniable aggression with sanctions blindly affecting a large portion of the world, violence and destruction continue to be fueled in inadmissible ways instead of placing all endeavors in trying to stop conflict and killing of innocent people. What, after having censored the web, airwaves, and several cultural and information sources, ruling out counterpoint and opposing views? Where is counterpoint in Europe nowadays? Maybe a simple way to answer these questions is to admit that Europe is finally and unfortunately at open war with Russia under the compelling push of the US and has failed to create an independent, constructive, and modern leadership 
forgetting its original message and objectives that many, a lot of people outside it had believed in and disregarding its diminishing size and relevance in the world scene. I do hope to be wrong because, as in the famous pre-World War I sleepwalkers metaphor, this path will lead not to a reasonable and fair defense system, but most likely to a tragic future for Europe. I'm sorry. Merci beaucoup, uh, Monsieur Flores. Uh, pour ce point de vue, uh... Thank you, Mr. Flores, for this uh, different point of view. It's important to listen to it. And you are actually uh, uh, having some points that will uh, give, that will feed some debates here. You may ask some questions if you wish on the app. Do not hesitate to ask these questions and those that will come up um, more, I will definitely talk about it and NATO is one of them. But before talking about the debate, before opening up the debate, most of the previous speakers have talking about the cyber war and cyber security. And this is why I will give the floor now to Mrs. Véronique Brion, who will talk about this. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to be among you. I will give you, I will talk a bit about cyber risk as an insurance company. We've talked about the war and weaponized war. In an economic war, we also have the cyber risk. This is actually a, a huge weapon. We can imagine in the current Ukrainian crisis and a targeted uh, attack on a country that is an ally to Ukraine, on a company, uh, whenever there's a, um, a controversy with one of the leaders of Russia. What we have seen with the ANSI results that were published recently, we haven't seen a lot of uh, cyber attacks that were directly linked with Ukraine, but we saw attacks that were more global, more extended in their um, origin. 80, 90 percent of cases is subware. Namely, the aim is to block a whole system and to ask for ransom to block, to unblock the system. That's cyber criminality that is very well organized with uh, unions that are well organized with uh, st strategies that are well oiled. We managed to demonstrate that some of these hackers are supported by states, even if it's hard to demonstrate it, we managed to do it. To substantiate this, I would like to talk about what happened in the US last year. In May 2021, there was the attack on Colonial by Pipeline. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Colonial Pipeline is a uh, no pipeline that actually feeds the whole US. It's se feeding seven airports, 90 military um, facilities, and that was hacked. It was completely blo blocked. There was an FBI investigation and the dark side group was actually identified as a suspect and it was supported by Russia ultimately and this is where we made a connection with the current uh, context. Another example to show also the systemic dimension of this type of attack, large week attack in uh, 2020, solar wind publishes software that is used uh, worldwide and the product that they were selling was infected by hackers and the fact that they distributed it to 30,000 companies actually uh, um, uh, widespread the risk of this uh, virus and that shows actually the problem uh, with this type of cyber attacks because it can actually hamper a whole economy. For Q1 2022, there were twice 
there were, uh, there were uh, twice more attacks than in 2020. That shows actually the exponential increase of cyber attacks. The, the, most, the weakest ones were banks and financial institutions at first. Now it's the in industry, infrastructures, construction. It was multiplied by five in three years. In, in terms of number of cyber attacks and the target of these attacks, even if we use uh, software, it's not really for money, but the aim is to paralyze the economy or to make sure that the whole sector of the economy is completely blocked. Once we've said that, then what do we do about it? I heard a lot of comments from panelists that were saying that there's a uh, a problem of emergency, that we do not have enough resources, that we are under-equipped. We have the same feeling here, this feeling of emergency. We need to raise awareness that we need on the, the importance of prevention. It's, it's not about uh, knowing whether it's going to be uh, arriving, whether it's going to occur. It's rather when it will occur, because it will definitely occur. And what about insurance companies? Because there will be not be enough to protect economies, or we need to have a collective awareness of this risk. We need to take measures. There's a certain number of things that exist already. The insurance industry is very close to public powers, public authorities, the treasury, the regulatory authorities, the ministries, to implement a certain number of initiatives because we need to have collective initiatives. May it be for the private sector, for corporations, we need to have prevention, protection, and it is urgent. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Brion. So now we will talk, we'll have a Q&A. We only have five minutes left, le left, unfortunately. I'll ask two questions. I'm sorry, the comment was off mic, so the interpreter cannot uh, translate. So, I said that the questions that will be asked on the app will be given priority. There was a question on cyber security and cyber attacks. It seems that the perception we have, because we have a lot of fears further to the Uk Ukrainian war, it seems that there are not a lot of at attacks, but actually it's the contrary. Maybe we overestimated the role of cyber attacks in the modern era. What do you think about this? And then we can give the floor to the other panelists. What is directly related to the Ukrainian conflict? Well. We haven't seen a huge increase of cyber attacks. It's deeper than that. Notwithstanding the Ukrainian war, we can see that cyber attacks are more and more used in the, for this economic war that we wage. And that was actually gaining momentum with that gained momentum because of the COVID crisis as well. So, of course, there was the Ukrainian war. There was not much more cyber activity, but in terms of economic uh, war and um, economic targets, then that is actually exponential. Thank you. We were talking about a European defense that would be built within, but also independently of a NATO. Should we have a European defense? Some say. Europe is not a sovereign nation, so it's hard to have a European defense. How can we build a, uh, it, how can we build a full-fledged European defense? I would very much like to see Europe strengthen its defense cooperation. But in the foreseeable future, Europe will still be dependent on a transatlantic cooperation uh, with the United States. Let me remind you that after Brexit, 80% of, uh, uh, of uh, defense investments in NATO are taking place outside the European Union. 
So any talk about a European army is fantasy. It will be a paper tiger. So let's be realistic. I would very much like to see a strengthened European defense cooperation to strengthen the competitiveness of European defense industries, to uh, facilitate free mobility across borders for our military, uh, to create a true internal defense market, etc., etc. There's a lot of things we can do, but a European army, no. It's still NATO. It's, it's clear. <laughs> Je vois que vous prenez tous les micros. Qui Lord Ricketts avait pris le, le very, premier. Very briefly, um, let's remember that the current phase of working on European defence began with a Franco-British agreement at Saint Malo in 1998. Um, and at that time, the American concern was that strengthening European defence forces would somehow cut across or duplicate uh, what the Americans were providing through NATO. I think the world has changed completely since then, and more European military capability should be useful to NATO, as well as potentially available to Europeans if the Americans are not involved. So I don't think anymore uh, it's a zero-sum game. It's a win-win that Europe should strengthen its defense capabilities. Admiral Vendier, would you like to say a word? Uh, would you like to say a word? Mr. Vendier, the matter of uh, European defense is often not well asked and not well phrased because it doesn't exist and it's being compared to something else and doesn't work out. I could underline uh, as a, uh, a member of the military with the European defense, we do actually military actions that are very interesting with Copernicus, for instance, with the satellite constellation, for instance, that is funded by the EU. In the Guinea Gulf as, as well, what we do, and the Indian Ocean, this is actually very much complementary to what NATO is doing. We do not to replace one for the other. We want to help out the, uh, on, on a wider space than that of NATO. The tools are the same, the communication systems are the same, and the interoperability is the same. Thank you. Point. Um, I would like to remind that when Federica Mogherini was the vice president of the European Union, Federica tried to develop the idea of an European defense, an European army of defense independent of NATO. That's not easy, of course. There are, there's a lot of work to do, but uh, uh, she was one. Her idea didn't go on. But the point which, uh, let us say, uh, worries those who are outside is that NATO was created to win over the Warsaw Pact. The objective of NATO was to annihilate the Soviet Union, which during the Cold War, yes, this was Article 1, during the Cold War, okay, this made sense. When the Warsaw Pact was over, everybody expected the NATO to end or to suffer an evolution. And Federica was one of the persons who tried to ensure that Europe would have its own defense, an European defense, autonomous. Uh, can, I, can I stop? Can I, can I speak? Please, thank you very much. C'est très gentil. So, but NATO overwhelmed. And now you are talking about the summit. They want to reach China. <laughs> Come on, it's an European defense that is, wants to defend Europe against the possible invasion of Taiwan by China. This, I'm afraid, is aggressive. This doesn't lead to anything good. I'm sorry. No, but it's very important to have a point of view different. Thank you very much. Okay, we, have we may have different opinions, but it's very interesting to listen to that. 
There is a real debate. Mr. Lucas wanted to speak. I will give you the last words. Marks to what you said, Professor Flores. First of all, I don't know what your sources are, but uh, you will not find a single open or secret NATO or national document which says the aim of NATO was to annihilate the Soviet Union. It's just not true. It was from the beginning a defense alliance, and, and everybody was totally sort of clear on that. Never any doubt about it. Um, and the second point about Federica Mogherini, you know, I worked in my previous um, uh, uh, functions a lot with Ferita Mogherini. Uh, she was very much in favor, as we are in favor of strengthening European capabilities and capabilities, but she never, as I can see, and you will never find a European document saying that, uh, that uh, her, her or, I mean, the goal of the European Union was, I mean, to, to, uh, to develop something militarily totally independent of NATO. Uh, that's also sort of very much enshrined in the Lisbon Treaty where we sit. As far as the collective defense of Europe is concerned, uh, NATO is still uh, in the lead. If you incline it. <laughs> Mr. Flores. Just, just one word. I feel inclined to disagree with the Honorable Ambassador. Just read the final report uh, of Federica's administration. You will see that very clearly. Thank you. Okay, merci. Donc, je vous propose qu on, qu on so, I, as we, should think, we should thank all the panelists. A round of applause, please. Big round of applause. Thank you.